I am very pleased to have this chance to give this lecture in the City of London um, because I think it's particularly appropriate because some of the work I'm going to present to you was carried out during my time at City University London, uh, which is just up the road from here in Northampton Square. So my thanks go to City University also for allowing me to work on something called the NREFS project uh, and the NREFS research project, and I shall be quoting from this later on. It's also appropriate for me to be speaking in the Museum of London, as nuclear power is, if not exactly antique, uh, then well on its way to being vintage, because man-made nuclear energy is now nearly three quarters of a century old. The first reactor went critical uh, in December 1942, and that was part of the Second World War Manhattan Project that was aimed at and led to the production of the atomic bomb. But the tiny amounts of energy that were produced in that first reactor were enough to demonstrate the principle of controlled nuclear fission. This allowed nuclear power to be harnessed from the mid-1950s on for the production of electricity. To put safety in the nuclear industry uh, in context, I'm going to talk first about what uh, the nuclear industry does and the range of tasks that it gets involved in. I shall start by talking about the generation of electricity and then talk about some of the other activities that are ancillary to that that are carried out in support of that purpose. Nuclear power now supplies an eighth of the world's electricity. There are actually 435 nuclear power plants in operation worldwide and there are 72 power plants which are under construction at the moment. Pressurized water reactors, which are called PWRs because the nuclear industry loves acronyms, uh, and boiling water reactors, or BWRs, are the world's workhorse reactors. PWRs were used first to power nuclear submarines, and then they were developed for onshore use to provide electricity for businesses and homes. Both PWRs and BWRs originated in the United States, although they are now designed and built by other countries such as France, Japan, China, and Russia has its own variant of the PWR, and that's called the VVER, which is yet another acronym. The UK was actually the first country to connect a nuclear power station to its national grid, and that happened in 1956. And that, those reactors at Calder Hall were Magnox reactors, and Magnox reactors have supplied electricity to the UK grid for about 60 years now. The last one is still uh, operating at Wilfa, uh, but it is due to close this year. Advanced gas reactors, or AGRs, acronyms again, have gradually taken over from the original Magnox reactors. Seven twin AGR power stations were built between the mid-1960s and the late 1980s, and they are still operating today. Size will B is the UK's first and so far only PWR. That has been running for about 20 years. Nuclear power used to make up 30% of the UK's electricity at its peak, but nuclear share has now fallen to 20% as a result of the older Magnox stations I mentioned previously being taken out of service. By next year, the UK's nuclear fleet will consist of just seven twin reactor AGRs and one PWR, all of them owned and operated by EDF Energy. EDF intends to build two more PWRs at Hinkley Point in Somerset and two further PWRs at Sizewell in Norfolk. Each of these will generate 1,670 megawatts of electricity. Meanwhile, Horizon, which is a consortium between Hitachi of Japan and General Electric of the United States, wants to build four PWRs at Wilfo in Anglesey and Oldbury in Gloucestershire. Each of these will produce 1,380 megawatts of electricity. 
New Generation, which is a joint venture between Toshiba of Japan and Engi of France, previously known as GDF Suez, will want, wants to build three PWRs at Moorside in Cumbria, each of which will supply 1,135 megawatts of electricity into the national grid. This means that the total new nuclear capacity planned is 16 gigawatts of electricity, with a big power station taken to produce about one gigawatt, which is 1,000 megawatts of electricity. This is equivalent to about 16 large modern power stations. This slide, in the first PWR picture, you can see in the foreground the Arriva Evolutionary Pressurized Water Reactor, EPR, at Olkiluoto, being built in Olkiluoto in Finland, and it's four of this type that are planned for the UK by EDF. The BWR shown is the Hitachi GE Advanced Boiling Water Reactor, or ABWR, and that one's in Japan at Oma, and four of these are planned for the UK. The last PWR picture is the Westinghouse AP1000, which stands, I think, for advanced PWR with an output of about 1,000 megawatts. And three of these are planned for the UK. Now, how far these live up to the style requirements of our new Energy Secretary, Amber Rudd, uh, I shall leave you to decide, but they are in fact, fairly compact industrial plants, and they stay pretty clean throughout their lives. Moving to uh, activities in support uh, of electricity generation, the production of the fuel for the reactor starts with purified uranium ore or yellow cake. This is heated and treated first with hydrogen fluoride and then fluorine gas to form gaseous uranium hexafluoride, or HEX, as it's known in the industry. The HEX goes into a centrifuge enrichment plant to increase its fissile component, which is the uranium-235 isotope, to between 3% and 5%, depending on the destination reactor, which it's going towards. The outlet stream of HEX is then <clears throat> exposed to steam and hydrogen <clears throat> to give uranium dioxide, and that's the ceramic powder. This powder is then pressed into pellets, which are typically one centimetre diameter and one centimetre long, and it's these fuel pellets that are loaded into the stainless steel or zircaloy cans that are known as fuel pins. Spent fuel, that's fuel that's been in the reactor, contains significant amounts of unused fissile material, uranium and newly made plutonium. Both of these elements can be used in power production, and so they are both valuable. In fact, the UK invested heavily in reprocessing up to about the year 2000. The ultimate goal was to recycle the plutonium in a fast reactor. The fast reactor can convert low-grade uranium into useful plutonium at the same time as producing the heat needed to generate electricity. And this has the big advantage, very big advantage, that it would make the world's uranium stocks last 50 times longer. The technology has been demonstrated, but unfortunately it's too expensive at the moment. It's likely that recycling in this way will become commercially viable only when uranium stocks are starting to run low. The UK started decommissioning uh, of its uh, shutdown industrial-scale nuclear reactors in the 1980s. Uh, some smaller experimental nuclear reactors have been decommissioned before this, uh, but that's one that it started in uh, real earnest. 99% of the reactor's radioactivity is removed when the spent fuel is taken out of the reactor. And then further dismant dismantling can put the reactor in a safe state for long-term storage prior to final decommissioning. I personally have a particular interest in the UK's first major reactor decommissioning project as I was customer project manager for the Windscale AGR, or WAGA, to use the acronyms, uh, in the 1980s. I was also in charge of the necessary decommissioning research, which was robotics, remote viewing, remote cutting, and so on. 
Wagga actually produced 100 megawatts of heat and 33 megawatts of electricity until it was finally shut down after 18 years operation in 1981. I'm happy to say that Wagga's core has now been dismantled and the reactor pressure vessel has been cut up and put into concrete-filled Wagga boxes, and these are stored within a purpose-built waste packaging building on the Windscale site, which is part of the Sellafield site. The ultimate ambition for decommissioning is a greenfield or brownfield site. Um, and in fact, just this has happened with the spent fuel examination facilities at the UK Atomic Energy Authority site at Kelcheth, uh, which is near Warrington in Cheshire. And you can see the before and after pictures. The fission products produced by the nuclear reaction become waste products. They are the, waste, the main waste product. This, uh, this high-level waste is vitrified, and the glass blocks are then stored at Sellafield in Cumbria. The fission products decay, and they continue to produce heat for decades as they do so. And this heat has to be removed by forced air cooling. But the amounts of high-level waste produced are very small. And to give you a picture, the vitrified volume of all the high-level waste produced in the UK for the last 65 years would fill the first five lanes of an Olympic running track to a height of about one metre. The small volume and the fact that it is all contained, which is unlike the carbon dioxide coming from fossil fuels, which comes out into the atmosphere. These facts led John Rich, who, was, who used to be Director General of the World Nuclear Association, to describe nuclear waste as a strong selling proposition for nuclear power. Waste, he said, is nuclear power's greatest comparative asset, precisely because the volume is minimal and can be safely managed without harm to people or the environment. Intermediate level waste is activated metal or material that's been contaminated with the products of fission. Packaged intermediate level waste is stored on the Sellafield site and it doesn't require cooling. Low level waste, which has greater volume, consists of lightly contaminated materials such as used overshoes and some medical wastes. Packaged and grouted low level waste is placed in concrete vaults in, at Drig in Cumbria. So I've now introduced you perhaps to some of the, um, some of the activities uh, of the nuclear industry, but what about the safety hazards? And particularly, what are the safety hazards which are unique to nuclear power? I think it's important to say at the outset that the laws of physics rule out an atomic bomb-type explosion. This didn't happen even at Chernobyl, uh, which is the worst nuclear accident the world has ever experienced. In fact, it can't happen because the nuclear fuel in the reactor is just not concentrated enough. It's enriched to typically 5% in the fissile component compared with the over 90% needed for weapons-grade uranium. A nuclear power station is, of course, a large process plant and will experience many of the same hazards that any large plant would be subject to. But there is the unique hazard, the additional hazard, of nuclear radiation. The nuclear industry produces four types of radiation, alpha particles, beta particles, gamma rays, and neutrons. The first two are stopped fairly easily, especially alpha particles. But gamma rays and neutrons are both highly penetrative and thick lead or meters of concrete are needed to contain them. This means that the reactor will be surrounded by typically three meters of reinforced concrete and that's known as the biological shield. All four types of radiation can ionize biological tissue and this produces a small chance that a disrupted human cell will become cancerous. That chance is proportional to the amount of energy the radiation deposits. 
That, that's the radiation dose, and to understand nuclear safety, you need to get a feel for radiation dose units. So what is a big dose of radiation, and what is a small dose? One joule of energy deposited into a kilogram of human tissue gives a dose of one sievert if the radiation is beta or gamma. But alpha particles and neutrons cause 10 times the damage, 10 times the harm for the same amount of energy deposited. And so in these cases, the dose would be 10 sievert. But the sievert is rather a big unit, and it's normal to work with millisievert. In practice, that's to say a thousandth of a sievert. The average UK citizen receives 2.7 millisieverts in radiation dose each year. And that's got nothing to do with the nuclear industry. Most of this comes from background radiation, and about a seventh comes from medical x-rays. The upper limits for radiation workers in the UK... The upper limit for radiation workers in the UK is 20 millisieverts per year. But no UK worker got more than half that amount in 2003, for, just for example. The average dose for, the UK, for UK radiation workers is less than one millisievert in a year. All these doses uh, are low, but what happens if you get a very large dose? A dose of 500 millisieverts or more will lead to radiation sickness. If the dose reaches about 4,000 millisieverts, a significant number of the exposed people will die within a few months, although about half will recover. But if the dose exceeds about 8,000 millisieverts, most exposed people will die in days or weeks or months. As an example, in the criticality incident in Tokai Mura in Japan in 1999, they were, they were actually manually mixing nuclear fuel in a highly non-standard way. One worker received 3,000 millisieverts, one received 8,000 millisieverts, and one got a dose of 18,000 millisieverts from neutrons. The two people with the high doses uh, both died within seven months. Now, coming back to low doses, the main information on radiation hazards comes from the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings of 1945. The health of 87,000 Japanese survivors of the atomic bombs was monitored between 1950 and 1997. The acute effects had all passed, but was there an increased chance of solid cancers? 41,000 of the 87,000 had died by 1997, almost all of these from natural causes. Of the 41,000 who had died, just over a fifth, or about 9,000, had died from naturally occurring cancer. And it may surprise you to learn that out of the 41,000 deaths in that time, just 440 were due to a radiation-induced induced cancer. We can conclude from this that radiation is, in fact, a rather weak carcinogen. Data from atomic bomb and medical doses uh, imply that the chance of dying before your normal term as a result of a cancer brought on by a low dose of radiation is 40 in a million per millisievert of dose for a member of, for a member of the public where it's assumed that the public, uh, the ages of the public will span all ages, it's 32 in a million per millisievert of dose for a nuclear industry worker who will be over 18. And these coefficients double if the one-off dose or the dose taken in one year is more than 100 millisieverts. So the question is, what radiation doses are experienced after a nuclear accident? Well, very high doses, thousands, a thousand or more millisieverts are very rare, even after a big accident, and will usually affect only a few nuclear wor workers at most. Just three workers, of whom two died at Tokai Mura in 1999, for example, um, and then after the world's worst nuclear accident at Chernobyl in 1986, 
there were 136 workers who received a dose of 1,000 millisieverts or more, and 30 of these died. But the accident may impose <clears throat> low doses on the remaining workforce or on the public. So about 100 workers received low doses at Tokai Mura and 20 members of the public. 161 members of the public were evacuated on a temporary basis at Tokai Mura. On the other hand, 335 members of the public were evacuated permanently or relocated after Chernobyl, and I shall come back to this number. The evidence shows that it's very unlikely that a member of the public will be given a high radiation dose after a, a, an accident. It didn't happen even after Chernobyl. This means that the main safety focus is on protecting the public from possible low doses, low doses of radiation. But how big is that risk? Previous studies have tended to concentrate on the high integrity of nuclear engineering and the elaborate protection systems that reduce the chances of a nuclear accident. And in fact, a modern nuclear reactor is expected to suffer a severe accident that that can affect the public, less than once in 10 million years. But my research team wanted to know what happens in the worst case scenario. What happens when a reactor goes badly, catastrophically wrong, as happened at Chernobyl and also at Fukushima Daiichi? And that was the question behind the NREFS project. Four universities came together for this NREFS project, and I was the principal investigator uh, while I was at City University. So the four universities were City University London, just up the road, Manchester University, The Open University, and Warwick University. And we concentrated on applying objective methods, not those that depended on people's subjective opinions. The judgment or J value allows the balance to be found from the gain in life expectancy that a safety measure brings about as against the cost of providing that safety measure. You're spending too much if J is bigger than one. Now, you can't say how long anyone uh, is going to live, anyone in this hall, uh, anyone at all. Uh, we might step under the proverbial London bus when we leave. Hope not. Uh, but life expectancy can give you a handle on that. Life expectancy is the average time remaining for someone of that age and that gender. And my team, now, which is now based at Bristol University, as uh, was said at the, in the introduction, has extended Lord Marshall's method for calculating loss of life expectancy caused by low-level radiation exposure. We assume slightly conservatively that a radiation exposure can cause death from cancer between 10 and 40 years on. This loss of life expectancy can then be fed into the J value, which tells you if the cost of the safety measure is worth it. I'm now going to give you some figures for you to bear in mind for comparisons later on in terms of life expectancy. 80 is the life expectancy at birth in the UK, roughly. 42 years is the population average life expectancy in the UK, and that means it's roughly how long a 40-year-old can expect to live. Three and a half years quite a large amount, three and a half years is how much life a Londoner loses by moving to Manchester. <laughs> you can imagine that having Manchester as one of our co-universities on this uh, uh, project um, it could be slightly embarrassing. Four and a half months, to even things up a little bit, four and a half months is how much life a Londoner loses from air pollution. So bear those numbers in mind. Now we're going to talk, and I'm going to talk about the Chernobyl nuclear power plant accident. The accident occurred on Chernobyl Unit, unit 4 uh, in the early hours of the 26th of April 1986, and it is the world's wor worst nuclear accident by a very large margin. 
The reactor went super prompt critical, and there was a huge nuclear power excursion, about 100 times the normal operating power, uh, and that lasted for about five seconds. That's a short time, but it's a million times too slow for it to be regarded as an explosion. The top of the reactor was forced off, there were fires, and there was an unobstructed, unhindered release of reactor core materials into the air for 10 days. Some of the core melted through the reactor pressure vessel into the basement below before cooling and solidifying. And that's the event which had been dramatized six or seven years before as the China syndrome. It's difficult to see how things could have been any worse, quite frankly. There were 30 immediate deaths of power station workers. And then 116,000 members of the public were relocated uh, in fairly, fairly soon on in 1986, and a further 220,000 were relocated after 1990, never to return. But were such drastic population movements necessary, or were they sensible? So we consider the Chernobyl first location, relocation. The 116,000 evacuated from the 30-kilometer zone by September 1986 gained about seven months' life expectancy as a result of that exercise. This implies a J value of three, and that meant that the evacuation was three times too expensive and so should not have been carried out. When we delved into the figures more, more carefully, the relocation, we found that the relocation of about 17,000 of those people would have been justified at J equals one. So the number of people actually evacuated was seven times too high. The next relocation occurred in 1990, and the map shows the relocation zone uh, extended uh, from the area marked in red to the area marked in dark orange on that, on that map. And the state all-union and republican program relocated 220,000 people at the cost of 40, 42,000 rubles per person but they gained just three weeks in life expectancy. Was it worth it? The J-value says not. The J-value came out at 21, so the exercise was over 20 times too expensive. Not one of those 220,000 people should have been relocated. In the event, the 116,000 first evacuees, who were the worst affected as far as uh, loss of life expectancy were concern was concerned, they lost just 9.3 days life expectancy due to the radiation dose they received. And we in the UK, we also experienced some uh, increase in radiation dose, and we lost about three hours. But even if no one had been evacuated and relocated after Chernobyl, the loss of life expectancy amongst the worst affected 6,000 people in the Ukraine, in the world, would have been about three and a half years. You remember this is the life expectancy lost by the average Londoner going to live in Manchester. The gain in life expectancy for the worst affected 2,000 people of the 220,000 people relocated in the second phase was two months. That's what they gained by being evacuated, the, just the worst affected 2,000 people there. And that's about half the life expectancy we lose in London from air pollution. Objectively, we can see that the scale of the potential radiation threat to the public is small even after the worst nuclear accident. Turning to Fukushima Daiichi, the three damaged reactors at Fukushima Daiichi shut down as they were designed to when the earthquake struck on the 11th of March 2011, but they lost cooling when the power stations were flooded by the tsunami 45 minutes later. Cooling was eventually restored, but the failure to remove the decay heat uh, that the fuel will generate before that happened meant that part of the core melted Explosions from the chemically induced hydrogen uh, destroyed the roof of the shield building and radioactivity escaped into the air. 
This radioactivity was added to by the radiation issuing from the damaged spent fuel pond on a fourth reactor. There were no radiation deaths, but 160,000 people were evacuated. The radiation release was about a fifth or a sixth that of Chernobyl. That 160,000 compares with the 267,000 people who were displaced by the direct effects of a tsunami. But importantly, we know that there were 1,121 deaths from the nuclear evacuation amongst residents of old people's homes in the first three years. The figure has now risen to 1,700. By assuming the excess deaths were in people over 70 years old, we can calculate an average loss of life expectancy of 27 days. But this is more than the 19 days that radiation would have cost them if they had stayed put. And these, our first outline calculations, are being confirmed by in-depth studies that are carried out, being carried out in Japan. So we have evidence here pointing towards evacuation not being an entirely safe option. It may cause net health detriments as well as incurring high costs. So now let's look at the, how the UK government reacted to Chernobyl. The UK imposed restrictions after Chernobyl on the movement, sale and slaughter of sheep on 9,700 farms uh, in North Wales, um, Cumbria, Scotland, Northern Ireland. The UK imposed restrictions on those 9,700 farms. By 2010, the number of restricted farms had fallen to 300, and the Food Standards Agency was asked whether the restrictions could be lifted altogether. And the agency said, yes, they could be. They calculated this was reasonable. But we looked at the interesting question of, should the restrictions have been lifted earlier? The Food Standards Agency actually took as their representative person someone who was actually eating a very great deal of sheep meat from the restricted farms. NREFs calculated that such a person would experience a radiation-induced loss of life expectancy of just one and a half hours. And the total number of such people had in any case to be quite low because the amount of sheep meat that the 300 restricted farms could produce would obviously be limited. In fact, the maximum number of people able to consume the large quantities of restricted sheep meat involved turns out to be 2,150. And these 2,000 or so people are eating the lot. This leads to a J value of 230, which is far too high to make sense. The countermeasures were costing over 200 times too much. In fact, the UK sheep restrictions were such poor value for money by 2010 that it's clear they should have been dropped much earlier. Keeping them in place for 26 years constituted an overreaction to Chernobyl. That is not to say there are not useful things that you can do after a big nuclear accident. 110,000 houses in Fukushima City were decontaminated, and this led to a sevenfold dose reduction. The gain in life expectancy was 35 days, and the cost was modest. The J value came out as 0.04 very much less than one, so decontamination was fully justified. But when we turn to the lessons to be learned from big nuclear accidents, the big lesson is how small the radiation damage is to members of the public from even the worst nuclear reactor accidents. Most of the harm has come from what can now be seen to be unjustified fear and worry and from the social disruption and dislocation caused by the relocation of hundreds of thousands of people. So is all well with safety uh, in the nuclear industry? In fact, there's a problem uh, and I, that I will point out to you, and that problem was with the metric the UK nuclear industry uses in deciding how much to spend on safety. Like most of the UK's industry, the nuclear business uses the Department for Transport's Value of Prevented Fatality, or VPF, as a benchmark for how much it should spend on safety. And here it is just following the lead of the Office for Nuclear Regulation and the Health and Safety Executive. 
Unfortunately, the VPF emerges as an essentially arbitrary figure and it is likely to be about four times too low. And for comparison, the UK Department of Transport uses a, a, sees a British life as worth about £1.8 million. But the US Department of Transportation sees the value, uh, sees the value of the life of a US citizen is worth about £6.1 million. And it thinks it could be as high as £8.6 million. Rather more, you'll see. So we now look at examining the basis on which uh, the VPF is set in the UK. The UK VPF, Value of a Prevented Fatality, is based on the opinions of 167 people given in 1997 and as interpreted using the two-injury-chained method. That's this method that I'm going to tell you something about. I suggest to you that common sense would suggest that two measurements of the same quantity, the value of a prevented injury for the same injury, should come out the same. But using the two-injury-chained method, they turn out to be very different and, in fact, barely correlated. If you look at this, which is very much a scatter diagram uh, with log scale uh, axes in order to compress it just so that you could see it, note the degree of variation of the value of a prevented injury for the same injury. Measure, measured one way, it varies from £300 to £50,000, and that's on the horizontal axis. Measured another way, <clears throat> but still using the two injury chained method, it comes out as from £100 to £3 million. This is on the vertical axis. Are people really disagreeing with one another by so much? And in fact, is each person really disagreeing so much with him or herself so much? The points that are scattered all over this graph should lie pretty much on a rather short straight line. And that straight line should have a slope of 1, not 8.24. So I think that it's clear that the method on which the UK VPF is based is falsified in the terms of the scientific philosopher Sir Karl Popper. The finally recommended VPF of £1 million in 1990, 1997, or the study actually appeared in 1999, is conceded by the authors to be a judgment call. But the judgment range is enormous. It covers two orders of magnitude, from 120,000 to 33 million pounds. With such a range, how much numerical guidance from the two injury chained method can be said to remain? The authors of that study, the Carthy study, wrote recently, we consider that the Carthy et al. study has made a useful contribution by providing evidence which blended with judgment helped consolidate the VPF. But how good was the previous VPF that they seem happy through applying their judgment to consolidate? The previous VPF came from the Dalvey report. Dalvey considered an earlier opinion survey from 1985 and then rejected the mean in favour of the median. This reduced the amount to be spent on safety considerably, then he lowered it still further on apparently political grounds. It is felt that the government's present concern for speedy traffic movement Sorry, it is felt that considering the government's present concern for speedy traffic movement, a value of £890,000 per statistical life saved is certainly on a higher side. This paper therefore suggests a lower figure of £500,000. It is the latter lower figure adjusted for increases in GDP that the Carthy study apparently consolidated. So, can the nuclear industry do better? The answer must be yes. It can replace the rather, rather crude measure of a single-valued VPF of dubious provenance with a more sophisticated J-value. 
which is an objective measure based on the economic and actuarial data that the Office of Nuclear Statistics, Office of National, excuse me, that the Office of National Statistics gathers each year based on the behaviour of millions of UK citizens. Importantly, the J value has been validated against data for 180 out of the 193 nations in the United, countries in the United Nations. Moreover, the J value has been extended to take environmental consequences into account, and the JT value, or total judgment value, gives objective guidance on what should be spent to safeguard both humans and the environment. The method is developed, and the nuclear industry can use it today. So coming now to conclusions, the nuclear industry is now firmly established worldwide as a provider of electrical power to industry and homes. On safety, the standout message from the NRES project is that nuclear power is a lot less scary than many people fear, even when it goes badly, catastrophically wrong. That said, it must be time to adopt properly scientific methods to guide the nuclear industry's spending decisions on safety in the UK. I thank you.